figure out our live stream, but I think we have it figured out. Thank you, tech people. It's pretty cool. So um, for all of you who are here live and all of you who are online live, welcome to Hope Church. Um, we have continued to be both surprised and impressed with our summer um, worship attendance. We thought we get this big space, we would enjoy April and May, and then June and July, we would be like, let's do some more here. Let's talk. Okay, closer. And I'll tell you what, all summer, we've had a lot of fun. I, it tells us when we get to the fall, it's even, it's going to be great. So thank you for being here. When we get to the summer, we try to do things either that are uh, more fun, like we have our annual Hope at the Movies series, or we want to do something that goes a little bit deeper or kind of gives a bit of the behind the scenes of how we think about um, scripture and worship and why we do what we do. And so at Kara's request, we are doing a sermon series called Debunking the Bible, which makes it sound like we really don't like the Bible or you're going to learn like it's all a pack of lies and that's not our goal for this series um, hopefully you don't walk away with that but she told me last year at christmas time and i think she shared a bit of, of this last sunday that um, she didn't look forward to advent sermons at all those weeks before christmas Did not look forward to those because she was like oh, we just preach a bunch of syrup and um, good feelings. It doesn't actually get to the depth of what's in Scripture. And we can't um, share all that happens in Scripture because people need to feel good at Christmas time. And it would just make everyone upset. So back then, she's like, can we in July kind of look at this again and even look at some other Scriptures? Of course. So last week, she talked a little bit about the manger and the Christmas narrative, and I'm going to continue this week looking a little bit at those um, birth narratives. Now, I want to say, um, I, it's interesting that Luke shared about telling someone that uh, you're at a church that's inclusive and for them to be surprised that that exists. Here are the two things that happened to me when I share, not only that I pastor a church like this, but I wasn't sent here. I actually helped create this. So uh, I'm, I have to blame myself for uh, any that we are. Two things that can be done. If someone goes to a church, especially uh, of another stripe or flavor, they say things to me like, oh, I go to a Bible-believing church. Mm, or, um, oh, I see. Oh, my church is Bible-based. Hmm. And you know what they're saying when they say that. Um, then, there, so that's on one end. Then at the other end, there, is, um, there are people who I, I say, you know, we're, we're fully inclusive. And they'll say things like, oh, good, I'm glad to hear that. I don't really like the Bible either. I, I, I think that it's no. So there is this a spiritual leader at a congregation that is inclusive and affirming means either you don't believe the Bible, you're not into the Bible. Is my mic not working? Thank you, Anish. Sorry, online people. Oh. All right. Hey, hey, that is service with a smile. <laughs> Before worship, it all worked fine, and we never know what is going to work in here or not. If you've ever been to a church and it's all worked fine, and you think, my, why does it work fine here? Notice the level that we're at. And then if you'll take a look this direction and see an enormous tower that way, it ends up sending all kinds of signals that interrupt the sound that's happening. We've also learned that if there's ever a police officer who holds, uh, sometimes there's a speed trap right here. Every time 
he or she presses their gun, it um, interrupts the mic. So you never know. It's the fun of a new church start and making spaces that weren't originally intended as sanctuaries be um, places of worship. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, so, yeah. That, that kind of thing probably doesn't happen in those Bible-believing churches because they believe in the Bible. They get all the money they need, and they have all the technology they need. It just happens. And then that other side of, um, oh, I don't believe the Bible either. That isn't what I was suggesting. Neither of those things are what I was suggesting. Um, what I've learned is that neither of those two groups has actually read and processed the whole of Scripture. The first group tends to have been saying they believe the Bible, but there, there's no way. If you've read all the entire Bible, everything that's in there, which I have on more than one occasion, there's no way that you can believe every single thing that's in there. All of us take parts of it that inform what we do believe. In fact, when we started this church, and we talk a lot about being inclusive, we talk a lot about that. To me, you've heard me say this time and again, that was just a given. I, I have a sweet friend who is, he's actually amazing. He's doing a new church start in southern Illinois, and he said, well, of course, all means all. All means all. And he, at this point, he's still at that, it's still a dream for him. He's still at that naive place where he's like, yeah, everyone's welcome. That's not going to be what my focus is. I'm like, ha ha, little do you know, my friend, because if you mean that, that will be what it's about because it's still so shocking. But for me, when we started, I was the same way. All means all. If we really care about the gospel message, this is what Jesus is about. All means all. What I thought would be radical, and what I still want to be a radical part of our identity, is that we're a place of theological thought and conversation. And what that means is that we're not discarding, we're not cherry-picking particular Bible verses, and we're also not just discarding Scripture as unimportant, but that we're actually investing time thinking and reflecting. And uh, that word conversation, which is apparently unique in 2018, to actually engage in conversation such that if there is someone who understands a Scripture one way, and another person who understands it a different way, that there is room to have that conversation and perhaps grow to a deeper understanding of what it means or at the least have respect for another view or another perspective. In a, a church that says we're, we're a Bible-believing church, I probably shouldn't do a southern accent. <laughs> uh, that is offensive. Um, that suggests that I haven't actually claimed the all means all. If um, we, goodness gracious, the whole sound thing. Um, uh, if we look at scripture that way where one person, it's usually the person standing up here, and the person standing up here is usually slash always male, um, they would be saying, here's how you should understand scripture. Here's how you should understand it. Here, we really want to create an environment where there is conversation, where um, an understanding from childhood or a college Bible study or something read last week might interact with what the preacher of that day says. You notice how we even rotate who is preaching on a fairly regular basis that's very intentional my dad's like wow daughter you got a good gig going on there as he he comes from a place where you know it's basically the the one pastor who preaches 48 sundays a year we rotate that intentionally so that there will be different voices and different conversation i i have to be honest when i hear one verse of scripture quoted, 
There's a part of me that um, has, if I don't know the person and trust that person, I immediately lose trust. Because I want to know, wait a second, why, why are you just sharing that one scripture? What came before it? What came after it? I'm that person that even John 3.16, I'm like, well, but wait, what's going on in John 3.15 and what's going on in John 3.17 and what was going on in John 2 and what's going on in John 4? What's the context of that scripture? What, and now you're all thinking about that. Huh, I never thought about what John 3.15 says or um, the fact that Jesus is hanging out with John the Baptist just after that. He was with Nicodemus just before that or in the middle of that. That is what is important to me. Now, here's... Here is both a strength and uh, a weakness of mine. I tend to think of it as a strength only. But I, um, I see things in big picture. That's just how I process the world. I, I look at things into the future, and I think big picture. So though I have read all of Scripture multiple times, I do not remember singular verses, and I I don't remember details. I can tell you the theme or what I think is the truth of any book of the Bible, but I can't tell you details. And this is a story some of you have heard, but in my Hebrew scriptures class, which is a class about the Old Testament, we had to read a certain number of books every single week. Or every, it, was a, it meant three days a week. Every, all three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we would have a quiz on what we just read, five questions detailed. Oh my goodness, that was the worst thing in the world for me. I didn't memorize those kind of details. There was, I, I could usually figure it out. It was fill in the blank, no multiple choice. And um, one time, no clue. I mean, I didn't even have a guess. So I put down the name of the professor, Dr. Roth, as the answer. This is an old German man, I mean from Germany, an old school academic. You don't write the name of the professor down. He gave me a half a point. Thank you very much. My perfectionist friend sitting next to me missed it also, and he was like, oh my gosh, what'd you put down for number four? I was like, Dr. Roth got half a point. He was so mad because he just lost that one. He could not believe that I had the courage to do that. And I did because I was trying to say, I'm not sure that this matters because I want to know what this story is actually about. And starting back in, um, I taught my first high school Sunday school class when I was just barely out of high school, 1993. Those people are now in their 40s, which... Is a, is a thing. But in that um, first class, I said to them, here's how I look at scripture. Um, you, in every, everything that you look at, you have to consider the truth versus the facts. What's true? What's factual? And that was like, they, it wasn't, we weren't fully into the postmodern world yet. And they were like, what? I, um, I don't understand what you're saying. Are, is, is the Bible not factual? Well, yes and no. There are historical aspects of it, but then there are parts of it that are not even intended to be historical. There are parts of it that the authors did not mean for us to look at through scientific, factual eyes. That's just not even the way it was written. It's like if someone drew a cartoon and someone was like, I'm not sure that that's factual. Well, no kidding, it's not factual, it's a cartoon. Like, I, I think that the authors would be looking at us trying to read it through these uh, 21st century eyes like, oh my goodness, you're missing the depth of truth here. And part of it isn't our fault. I mean, in the Psalms, there are many psalms that, and even in the book of Proverbs, that are written um, such that the first letter of the beginning of each sentence would have created the Hebrew alphabet in order. Like, you know, if you're reading a book to a little kid and it A, B, C, well, we don't see that as it's translated to English. We don't get that it's that kind of a device. We don't get um, that it's you know, things from 
first century Middle East aren't relevant to us. So even the stories that were meant to really engage people and pull people in because they would get it, we, it, it doesn't click with us in that same way. And so it becomes more complicated. So what we do naturally is to just, all right, we have to try to understand this. We have to try to think about this in a black and white way. And certainly there are aspects of scripture for which that is accurate. And there are parts of that that, that there were, it was never meant to be. It's, it's just confusing. And, um, and I wanted to give the gift to these high schoolers. I'd want to give this gift to a congregation. If you're sitting there thinking, I don't know Hebrew, I don't know Greek, I don't have the time to do the exegetical, which is the fancy word meaning all the background work, uh, exegetical research of every single scripture. I don't read my Bible with concordance. I'm lucky if I ever read the Bible, let alone all, all this stuff. So what am I to do? Here's, here's what I encourage. And for me, this is what this entire series, Debunking the Bible, is about. Really look for the truth that's contained within those scriptures. Last week, I read a book called Bear Town. It was about a community in um, Sweden that is based around um, hockey. That picture of those guys playing hockey, it, that's on the cover. And it's, it's not a true story, but that entire book was filled with truth about human relationships, the ways that people interact with each other. That book was actually translated into English, and I found out that it's a trilogy, so I get to, look, hey, I'm not into sci-fi, but I like the trilogies, so <laughs> connecting, no, all right. Uh, I, I loved this book because it um, really, it, it contained truth, and there was never a point in time when I was reading it that I was like, I don't get what's being said here because I don't think that actually happened. This didn't happen, that didn't happen. I was able to just look at it through the lens of, Wow, um, I, that's so interesting. I know someone like that. Oh, that's kind of like my hometown. It substitute football for hockey, and that's what goes on in Arcola, Illinois. And it was, um, it was really fun to read, and I'm now invested in those characters and reflecting on what they teach me about life. We can all do that with movies and books and music. I want to invite us to do that with scripture as well. What's the truth? What's the truth contained in there? And, and I, today we're going to do it through the lens of the birth narratives, the story of Jesus' birth, because we're all familiar with that story. I need to tell you something about that before we get to it. So long ago and far away, a about, I don't know, 11, 12 years ago now, I, um, with college students, I taught this lunchtime Bible study. If you add food, students will show up. And I thought it would be fun to do the same thing. Like, let's look at the birth narratives, meaning the, you know, nativity stories. And I got this um, white pad. And on one side, it said Matthew, and on the other side, it said Luke. John, John's birth narrative is this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that's not a typical kind of birth story, is it? And then um, Mark, skip, Mark doesn't even include a birth story at all. So um, Matthew and Luke are the ones that give all the fun details we like at Christmas time. And we read, first we read Matthew. It was like anything, and we, people were allowed to interrupt. Anything that jumps out at you is an important part of the Christmas story. Write it down. Write it down. That was on one side. And then we read Luke. Anything that jumps out at you is important. Write it down. Write it down. So we did this, and um, there were some similarities, like angels show up in both of them. Jesus shows up in both of them. Mary and Joseph shows up in both of them. But there were a lot of differences, and there were things that did not show up in both of them. And I had students very upset about this, like the church had been lying to them their whole life, like the Christmas story wasn't real. And there was one young woman who started to cry. 
and had to leave and uh, claimed it was for class and I knew it wasn't. That young woman is now leading our Wesley Foundation. Hi, Roxy. <laughs> you're you're going to be the one making 18-year-olds cry now. Your goal, yeah. Either you think that the goal in campus ministry is to help people belong and figure out what they believe. It's really to make 18-year-olds cry. <laughs> it's not. We don't want people to cry. I had no idea that that was what was going to happen. Um, because Luke and Matthew are communicating with different audiences. They were written at different times. Both of them were written after Jesus had already died. They were written well after that time period. It's sort of like if right now somebody wrote about the birth of um, John F. Kennedy. Like if someone shared all those details and someone else shared all the details, there'd be different things that would be shared, especially given who your audience is. What, what would really click with um, a group of baby boomers who were alive at that time and would want to know what was going on and understood all the background? What would really engage a group of 20-somethings that were not alive in the 60s but care about um, the, the social rights movement of that time? and the, and that kind of thing. So uh, that's what was going on. Matthew was writing to a Jewish population. He was writing to people who knew the Hebrew scriptures. He was writing to people who, who got that side of things. Luke was writing to people who had never been a part of this faith movement at all and was trying to share with them. Do you know what? In Matthew... The angels appear to the men, to um, Joseph, and, uh, and, it's, and men who are taking the action. In Luke, the angels keep appearing to the women, and that's where Mary has her great song. It's, it's different, and guess what? In Luke, that's where we get shepherds, the lowliest of the low. In Matthew, that's where we get the magi, the wise men, the highest of the high. It was two different audiences. I wonder, even though the facts are a little bit different in these stories, is the truth the same? we celebrating the same birth, remembering that celebrating Jesus' birth didn't have, well, hopefully Mary and Joseph celebrated his first birthday. I was a little slow to celebrate my second child's first birthday, but uh, maybe Jesus was their first, or Jesus was their first. I'm not trying to change those facts. Um, Je <laughs> Jesus was their first. So maybe they had a first birthday, but remember, um, people were not celebrating Jesus' birthday right after. He, right, it, it was as this Christian movement, this movement of people that were following Christ, after that got going, that's when they started it. Maybe you've seen on the History Channel, or I believe Kara shared last week, that Christmas, probably his birth wasn't December 25th. Oh, scandal. Does that destroy it at all? I don't think so. What's the truth there? I wonder if, just think for a second, if it was illegal to start um, to follow someone and to start a religion if that was illegal in this country which it's not in our country but let's say it was and you could be killed for it which was true for the people following jesus and you wanted to have a celebration a religious ritual around that where might you position your religious ritual such that people wouldn't notice i i was thinking like fourth of july you could have a huge celebration. Nobody in our culture would notice that you were starting something. So in that first, second century, the winter solstice, December 21st, was a huge cultural ritual. It made absolute sense to piggyback on that. It would be less noticed, but there's some genius to what they did. If Jesus represents light, if Jesus represents hope that the world is not coming to an end, if Jesus represents 
that the last thing is never the worst thing, then how genius is it to put the celebration of this birth on December 25th? Because here's what happens. If December 21st is the shortest day of the year, and it feels like, if you don't understand science, that the world is coming to an end, and that the sun is going to extinguish, and you're kind of watching that, it takes, not the 22nd, not the 23rd, not quite the 24th, but by the 25th, imperceptibly, a little bit at a time, there's a little bit more light, and a little bit more light. It's where it shifts from darkness to light. And of course, we know it grows until June 21st. So if the History Channel tells you, Jesus was actually born in the springtime, so those Christians are idiots. They were geniuses. This is not asking anyone to believe a pack of lies. It's to understand that the depth of the truth contained here is more important than the facts, right? That the depth of the truth is more important than the facts. Let's, let's look quickly at um, math, the Matthew version of this story. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. And, all right, this is without any concordances, without the understanding the Greek language, without any study prior to this. We're, we're just going to point some things out as we go. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So right there, um, we get a time period. We identify that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So we get a geography, which, okay, I, wa I wonder what's going on. And um, they ask, where's the child who has been born king of the Jews? Right there, a theological statement. This is Matthew, remember? So it's the people who are already Jewish. So it na names king of the Jews. We observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. Foreshadowing, maybe? Why would the political leaders of that day be nervous about who Jesus is? If you've taken a English literature class 101, you can pick this stuff up from Scripture, right? This was written after Jesus had already been crucified. So we begin, even at his birth, to understand the political leaders of the day are nervous about him. All this right there in the Christmas story that we usually just read solemnly with candlelight. Um, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes, so he called together the religious leaders of the day. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem. Why? For it has been written by the prophet. Oh my gosh, he's reaching these people who knew what was written before. And then he quotes it. And you in Bethlehem and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time which the star appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. Ha <laughs> ha, evil laugh here. Um, when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in its rising symbolism until it stopped over the place where the child was. We always put it over a manger, don't we? Listen to where they end up. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the manger, oh, on entering the house, that's what made Roxy cry. On entering the house, that, is that true? Oh. <laughs> See, we're not even at a, a manger in Matthew. On entering the house, hmm, maybe it was at a later time. Maybe they didn't, after she gave birth, didn't make her stay out there forever. But, uh, if you have only looked at the birth narrative from the perspective of a nativity, and of course, who can have all that stuff? You don't want a manger and a house. You have the magi show up to the manger, fine. But in scripture, on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, 
And they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him, what did they offer him? Baby blankets, bottles, some formula. Uh, no, they, they offered him these symbolic gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, symbolizing royalty and wealth and death and embalming fluid. That's a strange gift for a baby. I wonder what that points to us about who Jesus is and how people were going to perceive him and how the people who were reading that perceived him. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country. Wow. There is so much depth. If you're willing to even look at 12 scriptures and think, turn on that theological thought and conversation for just a second and consider what was going on here. Why might this have been shared? What is the deeper truth here? And what can that point to me about who Jesus is, about what it means to live a Christ-centered life, about what this all means for my life? That's, that's, what is important to me. That's why when I read the whole of Scripture, not particular verses pulled out of context, but the whole of Scripture, I find this God who loves absolutely everyone. And I find this God who loves absolutely everyone over and over and over again. When someone says to me, you're not a Bible-based church, I think we can find hundreds, if not thousands of Scriptures that talk about a God who loves everyone, includes everyone. And that, for me, is what a Bible-based, Bible-believing church needs to be. I'd love to invite the band to come, come back. And um, as they do, they're going to lead us in a song that they did last week. It, it points to when all of this gets too much. Maybe these details are too much. I do think it's worth reading, investing in scripture. But to get back to what is the heart of the gospel? What's it mean to be in relationship with God and in relationship with each other? What's it mean to build our faith? And perhaps we've made it more complicated than it needs to be. Perhaps we've let all these words get in the way of really getting to what's most important, to love God and love self, love neighbor. That's what Jesus said are the mo it's the most important thing in all all of scripture. So take it. <laughs> We've got a lot of things up there. <laughs>